Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today I have a real treat for you. We will take a deep dive into the nature of reality, consciousness, and who do we think we are. (laughs) I know from your feedback that many of my listeners love this topic, and the deeper the rabbit hole we are going into, the happier you are. (laughs) Well, you won't be disappointed with this conversation, I can promise you. Today, I'm speaking with my special guest, first-time guest, Dr. Howard Eisenberg, MD. Dr. Eisenberg is a medical doctor with postgraduate training in psychology and psychiatry. He's been a lecturer at the University of Toronto and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Vermont. He is also the CEO of the international consultancy Centric Inc. On a more personal level, he's been on a passionate, lifelong quest to discover the true nature of reality. He's the author of two books, Inner Spaces, Parapsychological Explorations of the Mind, published in 1977, and the most recent one, published in 2021, Dream It to Do It, The Science and the Magic, which we'll be drawing on in our quantum conversation. You will find more information about Dr. Eisenberg in his guest profile on my podcast website, quantumlivingpodcast.com. Hello, Dr. Eisenberg. Welcome to Quantum Living. It's such a pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you, Anna. A pleasure to meet you. And I thank you for the opportunity to share this information with your listeners. Thank you. As you may have read on my website, I've been on the lifetime quest to find out how life really works, just like you perhaps in a different way. (laughs) And this is also my passion and the reason why I started this podcast in the first place, in addition to my own research. So let's talk about the flip side of reality. I like, by the way, to encode the essence of the episode in the title. (laughs) The more quirky and intriguing, the better. (laughs) And usually by the end, the listeners can decode it. As open-minded, creative, and intuitive that I am, I'm also very practical. And so in exploring the mysteries of life, the universe, and reality, I always have an underlying purpose to find their practical applications. And so beyond satisfying our curiosity, I ask how can we use this knowledge and understanding in a practical way to improve our life experience, even if it is an illusion we still have to live it. So this will be my angle in this conversation. You know, I was very inquisitive as a child and was often asking my parents strange questions. (laughs) I remember when I was about six years old, I asked my father, how do I know that I am me? My father looked at me with disbelief and didn't know what to say to such a profound question from a six-year-old. Since I've never got the answer to this question, I'd like to ask you, how do I know that I am me? (laughs) Well, when you think you know it, Anna, that's an illusion. Because what you consider to be right now, you, your me, is more like a a virtual uh, identity. It's not your true identity. Your true identity is is way beyond your sense of who you are. In my second chapter, which is entitled The Only Thing You Can Absolutely Know, you know, I go back in part to people like Descartes and point out that we can doubt almost everything in life, in the world, 
But there's one thing we cannot doubt, that we're aware. It's the only thing we cannot doubt, because sometimes we could be in a dream, think we're awake, until we wake up from the dream. But in the meantime, we think that's our reality, and yet it's just a dream. And similarly, sometimes we're very fatigued, and it alters our perception, our memory. Uh, sometimes people are under the influence of, of drugs, which again alters their, their perception, their judgment, their memories. So the only thing, coming back to it, strictly speaking, you can absolutely know without question is that you're aware of being aware, whether you're in a dream, whether you're in a drug state, whatever it might be. That's all we can definitely know. Now, you do have a sense, of course, of being a me <laughs> yourself. But, you know, I'll use the example again, if you don't mind, of what happens in dreams. When we have a dream, an ordinary dream, usually it's populated with other people, perhaps other creatures, uh, different types of physical environments. And yet it's all coming out of the dreamer. But in the dream, it all seems so real and separate. And I think right now we are plagued by this sense of disconnection from each other and everything else. We actually are in the illusion that we really are separate, that we're like a separate person, a separate ego, and that then leads to, well, I want what's mine. Maybe I also want what's yours, but you definitely can't have mine. And we start, you know, looking for how we can get more advantage, more competitive advantage, more material abundance. And it's entrapping. We get more and more into the sense again of separation away from our source, away from our connection with everyone else. And this is the almost like a plague, as I say, of disconnection we're experiencing in our world right now where you see outbreaks of social breakdown in various ways all over the world right now. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I love the quote in your book of the butterfly dream. Mm -hmm. And I actually have, coincidentally, in my email signature blog, my favorite quote by the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. A dream is not reality, but who's to say which is which? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I, I just love this quote, which, which I think beautifully encapsulates what we are talking about. So how can we know, or can we, which is which? Is dream our reality or our reality as we're experiencing it now, when we are speaking, for example, is our dream of a butterfly? <laughs> well, it's not so much either or. Um, again, back to chapter two and the title of it, the only thing you can absolutely know, there is only one thing you can know that you're aware of being aware. Not whether, coming back to your question, Anna, whether you're in a dream state or you're in a so-called waking state. All we can know, for sure, because we can be fooled in those other respects. So it's the only thing we can absolutely know. So if that's the case, what are the consequences of that status quo on our life? So in this understanding of reality being connected, unitary, and it's all coming from the same ultimate source, underlying, if you like, source I call sometimes the, the world behind the world. It's not, you know, the visible thing we see in our, again, world of illusion, the virtual reality we live in. So I think of the source, if I could go back, and I'm trying to use analogies that we can relate to as ordinary beings, because some of this is pretty far out, as you said, if you go down the rabbit hole, so, sure, yes, please. <laughs> in a sense, the, the source of everything is the grand dreamer, what some people would have called in the past and still currently perhaps God. I don't use that word because it's so loaded with different divisive connotations from other religions. I use the term in my book, universal mind. I'm using a term now, I think even more basic, just calling it source, the source from which we all come. So continuing with some analogy to try to make it more digestible, so, in a sense, the source is the dreamer, the divine dreamer that dreams everything up. So, there's not really an absolute difference between something in a dream and something not. It's all in the dream from the source. When we experience ourselves in the illusion as being totally individual, when we learn, first of all, as I try to share in my book, a deeper understanding of what it all means and how it can be this way, and we also learn the techniques. Again, I try to do this in my book for my, you know, readers, teaching them things like meditation, how to go into different levels of consciousness, teaching them things like lucid dreaming. How can you play with dreams? How can you reshape them? 
because if if, if reality is in some way dream based, and if you learn to be able to alter dreams, you're altering reality, and it starts leading to what we call manifestation potentially. Yes, thank you. And we will talk about manifestation in a moment. But firstly, let's talk about the uh, consensus reality that you are describing in your book. And again, I will include a, a link to your mm -hmm. book and to your website and all your online presence in the show notes so that people can find you. And I, I've read the book, your latest book, and I highly recommend it. It's, it's a beautiful book with lots of profound thoughts and, and hypotheses and theories, but also with study evidence and research evidence. And so, yes, I highly recommend it. Thank you. So coming back to my question about consensus reality, and my question is, how consensus is it really? Because pretty much every person perceives the world in their own unique way, often very different to others. And we know it, obviously, from our daily interaction with people. Mm -hmm. So how consensus is, or to what extent, is the consensus reality the same, or consensus, strictly speaking? Well, first of all, um the term consensual reality was developed by a psychologist in Paris, Dr. Charles Tart. And it's not like, again, a simple either or, like there's consensus reality or there's not. There's different consensuses about reality. I mean, that's part of the problem right now. If you think of what's going on politically in the world right now as we speak, mm -hmm. yeah. there, are, there are people who on some level are aware of the same facts to a degree, but they have a very different interpretation on to the degree that they want to snuff out, uh, destroy, perhaps, you know, the others have a different point of view. Even in the United States right now, which has been the beacon of democracy for so long in the world, it's on the verge of collapsing as a democracy because of the divisiveness where you have two huge blocks of potential voters for the two major political parties totally disagreeing on who's telling the truth, what's important. So, I repeat, it's not just we're all in the same conceptual reality. It's part of our problem with the divisiveness. But another way of looking at conceptual reality, when we are, so to speak, on the same page and experiencing it mutually with people we interact with, I like Shakespeare's metaphor, all the world's a stage and we're but players on it. You know, so we agree to be in a play together, in a sense, you know, like community theater, whatever you, you know, because it's fun, you do it. And that's your consensual reality. You're, yeah. you're all in a play together. <laughs> but I like to also yeah. you know, break out of the mold that, that may seem confining in a way and say, but the good news is, although we may all be, in a sense, players in a, a play, we can improvise. We don't have to stay on script. This goes back you know, to the personal empowerment when you start realizing how it all works. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And I will come back to the notion of karma, free will, and destiny, because this is probably one of the most contentious concepts or cluster of concepts. But thank you. You have made a very important point to differentiate between the consensus reality and our interpretation of it at the individual level, which dissolves this apparent paradox. So thank you. Thank you. Now, Again, in your book, you talk about that perception changes reality. Yes. I would say it, it modifies our sense of reality. Uh, it's not so much that it changes. It's, it's our consciousness that changes reality, not just you know perception. Okay. So now you differentiate between consciousness and perception. Yes. Perception is part of what we call consciousness. For example, perception doesn't include intention, right? Right. And perception doesn't necessarily um, include creative thinking. So now it's just a part of consciousness. Okay, so this is a more passive mode of interaction with reality, yes, than consciousness? In a sense, yes. And that's why we get into the illusions. Okay. Now, what I would like to refer to, again, going back to your book, when you said that in the martial arts, advanced practitioners use their imaginal power of their minds to project mm -hmm. an outward influence. Yes. Mm -hmm. on the plasticity of conventional physical reality. They purposely imagine the desired mm -hmm. energetic feelings and intended impact so as to manifest them in the outer world. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain this with some examples? 
Well, I'll take an example uh, that, again, may be more familiar to your listeners of Tai Chi, as it's taught even today. It goes back a long, long time in ancient China. It initially was more of a martial art, I understand, for the monks. But today, uh, for many people, it's a form of meditation and a way of just promoting uh, physical health vitality. Um, but in Tai Chi, you're doing certain movements to supposedly generate more of the vital energy, which they call qi. And when you do these things and you feel the energy going into your body, you're able to increase it, you're able to rebalance it. But although to most people, and even people who do Tai Chi classes, especially Westerners, let us say, who don't have the, the deeper you know, experience with it culturally, they think it is all about the physical movements. And it's not. It's a mind game by far. You are generating the energy from your imagination, not from the physical movements of your body. So this is like a misconception people have about it. Right. Interesting. So, for example, you know, in, in other areas too, like clinically applying it, in uh, the nursing world in the West, there's something called therapeutic touch, where sometimes nurses will put their hands by, you know, a patient lying on a bed to try to give them sort of healing energy or balance their healing energy. The Bible referred to this as laying on of hands. Experiments have shown that that simple, you know, exposure of light touch, not trying to, for example, move energy spots like acupuncture or acupressure, but it has physiological changes, not just subjectively, psychologically, but physiologically. When we come to ourselves as individuals, as we experience ourselves again, it's part of our reality. I don't think it's not, you know, uh, at all reality, but to me, there's different levels of reality. I think of us as I call it being amphibious beings. Amphibians like frogs and salamanders can live either in water environment or a land environment. We can be apparently in this uh, mode of apparent individuality and separation, but we can also learn to shift into a wider sense again of awareness and connection with everyone and everything. It doesn't have to be just a one way, you know, road. One way you want to go one way or the other way. You can learn to go back and forth. So let me come back to an example, which we know again um, uh, in common life, and certainly it's a medical thing going to my background, the placebo effect. If, if somebody believes that they are given a medication by a, a trusted physician or nurse that will help them with some condition, even if it is chemically inert, basically empty, like a so-called sugar pill, if they believe it, they often experience the benefits of changes. And I don't mean, again, just psychologically, physiologically. So, you know, you're altering perception, partly with your intention, because the expectation itself is a form of intention. Yes, absolutely. And there's one particular example you also described in your book about martial arts practitioners. Yes. And this is quite commonly known example breaking with the bare hands through a wooden board. Right. And mm -hmm. what you're saying is what I found really interesting is that it is not about just their physical power or the energy coming from them to break through a thick wooden board, but they are going through a different process. Could you speak to this? Yes, and that's, that's a good example. I'm glad you brought that one up. And actually, that exercise is often... Um, introduced to very young students in the martial arts in case for example my own child my son when he was around 10 he did a demonstration where i saw this for the first time and that's how i also learned how it's done because i asked him i was so curious so so in this you have uh, the instructor uh, holding a wooden board uh, one end in each hand and uh, the students and i see many times they're very young as my 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 son was he was in a young class so there was a similar age they are asked with their bare hand, this is important to remember this too, in one single movement to break through the wooden board. And they do it, almost all of them. And I was very curious when I saw my son do this demonstration with his class. It was a, a parent's uh, you know, opportunity to see uh, how their children were performing and, and benefiting from these things. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him afterwards, I said, I knew they had to teach him to do something. I knew it wasn't just hitting it, but I didn't know how. So I said, how did they teach you to do that? And none of the kids had fear either when they did this. He said they didn't teach them to hit the board at all. They taught them to strike through and beyond the board. So the goal was not hitting the board. The goal was something beyond the board. Wow. And I think, and this is true, again, from my son's experience, and I've had many readers since tell me they relate to this in their own 
you know, experience uh, earlier in life being uh, in a martial arts classes of various sorts. But to me, the board also represents symbolically what I call limiting beliefs. Because if you, if you do not believe that you could safely, you know, hit towards the board and not hurt yourself or maybe embarrass yourself because it would only be a slight crack and everyone else perhaps is more successful. But if you have those types of restrictions in your mind, it holds you back and you don't have the power. And you don't realize often if that happens that it's you. <laughs> it was your limiting beliefs. It wasn't that life's, you know, unfair or things were stacked against you. Yes. And another thing I'm hearing here is that it is also about focusing on the outcome, yes. which is in this case is your hand yes. on the other side of the board, which is broken by then. And they, they focus on the outcome as opposed to how will I get through the process Yes, is what yes. creates this energy exactly. connection between now and the outcome. Precisely. Yes. Wow. And the more vividly you can, you know, just imagine you can just do it and, yeah. and get out of your own way and just do it, then the more, you know, power in your ability to do it. You know, as I also explain in my book, Anna, everything, again, is coming from an underlying source, consciousness. And coming back to how we experience ourselves for a while in this temporary state of individuality and different personality, egos, we, we can learn to connect to each other and to change even our, uh, how say, our material circumstances. We understand that everything, without exception, everything comes ultimately from imagination. So even if you don't believe in spirituality and this is all woo-woo, you know, or occult stuff, nevertheless, the evidence I present in my book is from real history of the major scientific discoveries and the discoverers. Um, of our whole, you know, Western technological culture that we have today. And all of it comes just from imagination. Even people like Einstein, who was famed as an adult, as a mathematical genius and, you know, formulating the understanding of the universe. But he began his study of cosmology at the age of 16 by imagining riding a beam of light through the universe and how that would change everything. <laughs> That's how it started. Nikolai Tesla who was the genius who developed most of our electrical infrastructure that we still use throughout the world today. He developed all of his inventions visually in his mind. He could even, when he developed a device, sort of turn it on, the power on, to see if it actually would turn on, and then you know how, how would it operate, how would it run, so he could fine-tune it all in his mind. So he's sort of doing what we call today a computer simulation, all his imagination. And he was a student of the ancient Vedic text of India, and the old wisdom traditions. So again, we, we have a very misconception of where science comes from. We think it's, well, it's logical, it's empirical, it's objective. It's all illusion. Yeah. It all comes within everything. Yes, and this is absolutely fascinating and so much food for, for thought. And I guess a somewhat perhaps even depressing fact is that we can't really understand how this works, mainly because we are within that which we seek to understand. We are not outside of it to properly investigate it. So we are within the, the consciousness. And and since consciousness with a big C is, as we say, omnipresent, by definition, there is no place that it is not. Right. And right. so we can't really understand because even when we leave this life and move to the afterlife, to other mm -hmm. experiences, mm -hmm. we will always be inside that big consciousness. Yes, but with different degrees of extension. Again, like as I said, right now, we have great divisiveness in the world where people don't believe intellectually and do not feel experientially the connection with all human beings and even the rest of the animate world and uh, nature as the indigenous cultures do. Mm. Speaking of connection, as I understand, your master's thesis is titled Telepathic Information Transfer in Humans of Emotional Data. Mm -hmm. Did you limit your inquiry to emotional data transfer for the sake of focus? 
or is telepathy, in your view, based on emotion rather than thought? Uh, it could be both, actually, in terms of the experiments that parapsychologists do. But if you like, coming back to why I designed my experiment the way I did, when people in everyday life occasionally have what we call spontaneous psychic experiences, people might call it a premonition or a deja vu, something like that, or just a very strong gut feeling, these are things that are not extremely uncommon mm -hmm. in the world broadly, even though some people think, you know, we shouldn't talk of such things because it's science and we're more rational, but they're not uncommon. And almost all of the ones that come up that we find it about, here's spontaneous uh, stories about, are about some emotionally charged mm -hmm. thing. Uh, someone, for example, has a sense in the middle of the night that someone very close to them has just perhaps passed away. And they find out in the morning when they wake up that around that time, their dear, you know, friend or relative did actually pass on at that time. Um, or someone is injured and they have a sense again at some distance, you know, that that's occurring. The connection between our sense of reality and the greater reality, if you understand it's, it's within our, our hands, within our means, back to what I said about being amphibious beings, to shift either way, to go deeper again into the sense of connection or come out into the sense of individuation and realizing like Shakespeare, you know, we're, we're doing it sort of semi-voluntarily, you know, to, to play, to enrich, to learn. And this, this maybe goes back to even the deeper question. If all of this comes from source, for what purpose? Why? If if source is always there and it's everywhere, as, as you correctly said, mm -hmm. and if it's, so to speak, has all the knowledge and all the power, uh, being godlike in that sense, so why bother to create us? I mean, we're so much trouble. <laughs> we're making a mess of the house. We were, you know, given. Uh, I, I've said uh, just recently in a presentation, it's almost like we as humanity, have just experienced a second expulsion from the Garden of Eden <laughs> for being such naughty people. Um, but mm. taking it a little more seriously, so why would God, source, universal mind, why would it create by, in a sense, dreaming up ourselves and the rest of what we consider the wor our world and the universe uh, more broadly? Because <laughs> to have awareness, and source is awareness, you have to have something to be aware of. So in a weird way, Source needs us to be the objects, you know, of its awareness. And in a way, to go a little further, I said again, we're amphibious beings, we can go at both levels. So in a sense, source, in a sense, imagine us into skin suits, think space suits. Mm -hmm. And we're all on an earth walk, not a moon walk, an earth walk. In a way, that's what it's like. So, you know, when we send astros to the moon, they were communicating back here on Earth. They were sharing some of the things they were experiencing. They were taking photographs, they were taking samples, but they're going back to the mothership yeah. and, and the mother planet. Yes. In a way, that's what's going on. So again, source needs something to be aware of. And and that's why it, it manifests, it creates this outer reality. But again, everything in this outer reality, and coming back to ourselves, can learn to go back into source and draw on the greater wisdom and resources, power, some might call it, but I don't mean in an egotistical way. Mm. Hopefully it makes some sense. It's pretty mind-boggling. but <laughs> mm. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And I actually would like to, to go deeper into this. And I love because you, you've you actually started answering my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we are communicating <laughs> telepathically here. <laughs> and in fact, this is so fascinating that I just would like to, to take a moment to speak to this. And I'd like to refer to your, your quote in your book, a, a quote by Alan Watts, a British philosopher, as he describes this veiling of reality as a metaphorical game of hide and seek. And he says, God, or the universal mind, shapeshifts into being you and I and all the people, animals, plants and stars, so it can have entertaining adventures. And I love when I read this, because this is exactly what I believe is going on. And I even wrote in my recent blog post on my podcast website, titled Karma, Free Will and Destiny, in addressing the question of what's the point of us, as you just <laughs> asked the question of us, the souls living countless lifetimes. And I said in my blog, we are an experiment and a play. 
if you like, constantly unfolding in countless dimensions and realities across the multiverse, a petri dish in a school of gods. We were given free will and the power to co-create our experiences through the interplay of emotions, the ego, and the blueprint of our destiny. The ultimate outcome is unknown, and while confined to some extent within the few parameters we can't change, free will is the magical tool we have at our disposal to create a surprising and riveting plot in our live screenplay before the curtain comes down. Surprising? Yes, the creator wants to be surprised and entertained for the lack of a better word. If every moment of every life, every experience of every consciousness and soul was pre-programmed and predictable, it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> so I found in your book... It would be boring. <laughs> yes, well, it would boring. be boring. So I'm really excited that I found in your book or via your book that quote uh, mm -hmm. from by Alan Watts describing the, this concept exactly as I believe it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and I understand that you obviously agree with this point of view. I do. And let me just expand it, Anna, for your listeners, you know, still maybe a little confused when we're describing it. Um, so again, we are in a sense streamed up from source as on a level of consensual reality in an apparent uh, state of separation from each other and again our physical environment but as i say it's illusion it's only a very a very small part of the total picture there, there is a way for your listeners perhaps to prove a little bit to themselves as an experience as i've been understanding my book intellectually uh in a few minutes um the reality and part of what i'm talking about that uh our perception of ourselves as again individuals and this is who we are <laughs> uh totally and again, separate from everything else, as I say, it's illusion. So an, any, an easy way to experience this for many people, and I'll describe it, but I also caution your listeners, only do it for a few minutes. It's very powerful, and it, can, it may be overwhelming, not to play with it. If you look at your face in a large mirror comfortably, perhaps one you're looking into on a wall, so you don't like hold it in your hand, and you just look at your face, and initially you know you're looking at your face, you recognize it, hopefully, and uh, it may not look as good as it used to, or you'd like it to look, but you still see it as, as your face. However, as you start to reflect a little more on what you are seeing, you also become aware what you are seeing in the mirror image is not you. It's, yes, it's your face. So in a sense, it's associated, it's correlated, connected in a way, but it's not you at all. You are, so to speak, what is aware of that visual image in the mirror. So that's a way of getting a bit of a sense, again, of the two levels, that there's something much deeper, much more profound than the surface. Thank you. And I actually have had this experience to the point where I was looking at my face in a mirror and a thought came to me, who is this? Like, I literally saw myself as someone or something that is not me, really me. And I have to say that the sensation was somewhat scary. It was so powerful because I just looked at myself and thought, who is this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understand that. At the deeper level, obviously, because I recognize myself. Then when you were six. <laughs> then when you were six. <laughs> but it's interesting, still the connection, you know, that the seed was still in you to wonder such things. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have another quirky question for you. <laughs> Very quirky Mm -hmm. If we walk backwards or move things counterclockwise, mm -hmm. do we change the flow of energy and go back in time, even if by milliseconds? <laughs> time is an illusion. So it's one of the constructs we have, just like 
as I said, we think the world we're in right now, as we look at it visually and can touch certain things, is the world as it really is. And it's not. Again, it's illusion. Time is also illusion. So we know, for example, in parapsychological experiments, they're able to test people's ability to have what we call precognition, to know the future in advance. On this level, reality, but somehow they're able to gain that awareness and be able to accurately predict you know, what will turn out, how things will uh, uh, eventuate. We all have that potential ability, but of course, we're not, first of all, we're not taught such things are possible generally in our culture, and we're not given uh, instruction in most cases to develop such, you know, uh, understandings, capabilities. But we all have that potential ability to go in or out of this sense of what we call, to, you know, our present time. And there are people who also go backwards. But if you're asking me, uh, are they actually changing time itself? No, because the time is just an illusion. If time doesn't exist per se, as a dimension, as some physicists propose, or as energy, but it is an illusion, how can you explain time travelers? And a number of people have experiences with time travelers from both the future and, and the past, myself including. I've had an experience with someone I heard and I've received a telepathic message that they were traveler from the future. I'm a quite intuitive and even psychic at times. So I know. Yes. So mm -hmm. that's not surprising per se. But my question is if time doesn't exist, how can you explain time travelers? Uh, I'll go back to again the analogy that we're all in a dream and everything is within the dream. And there are no physical constraints, barriers, or energies required. It's all coming from consciousness, sort of from thought in a sense and imagination. So it doesn't mean you can't experience things like time travel. But if you mean in a physical sense, have you really violated, you know, the, the direction or flow of time? Mm. No, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> and, and we can go also back into other historical periods. And we could even perhaps uh, connect and feel we're participating in other historical eras because it's all contained in source, everything, and all possible things going forward too. Mind-boggling, mind-boggling, mind-twisting. <laughs> Is our life, in your view, 100% predestined or do we also have karma and free will? Good question. Thank you, Anna. It's not predestined. There is no other um, being or entity uh, controlling us. We are the source. We are both the created and the creator. Nothing's fixed. We think of karma, we think of something that's fixed. It doesn't work that way. Potentially, you know, you have to go clear your mind and go deeper into yourself to have that clarity. But yes. So we do have free will. Yes. And going back to Alan Watts, you know, this is what's part of you needed for the illusion of reality for it to work, so to speak, for source, to, to be entertained. That, you know, it, it, it seems like there's more gravitas in our existence than there really is. Mm. And I think that this whole notion that our life is just an illusion or a dream is probably one of the most difficult concepts to grasp. And mm -hmm. obviously, we can't really grasp it intellectually because of the limitations of our brain, which is linear in thinking even those people who can think laterally. <laughs> mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it is, I feel it is difficult to accept because then the question arises, okay, if this is just all an illusion, just a dream, why bother? I mean, if this is not real, what is real? <laughs> okay, so what is real is source. But again, uh, you know, the expression one is the only number. And as I also explained, to have awareness, consciousness, you have to something to be conscious of, right? So that's the reason, again, that all this, so to speak, you know, is existing this way. And you're quite correct. It, it's it's hard for us, trained in a Western way of thinking, wh where we're taught there's an external material reality, and the leading science is physics because it studies the material reality and chemistry about how things are put together. I mean, we're so, you know, um, conditioned, programmed to think that way. We think it's the only way to think, but it's not. I mean, even, for example, where you're coming from now in Australia, your Aboriginal cu culture, which goes back thousands of years, they believe in something called the dream time. And yeah. they believe in their culture yes. that the dream reality is more real 
than the what we call the waking reality. So even in your own you know country there in Australia right now, there's a very strong, deep historical roots of this belief system. Yes. So to bring this to the practical level, as I like to do, what would you say to someone or to people who have this anxiety, level of anxiety that, mm -hmm. you know, psychological anxiety, this is just a dream and they don't have a reference point if this is all an illusion. What could you say to those people to ease their anxiety about the nature of their existence? So when I say it's a dream, I'm using an analogy to try to have a, something that people could somewhat relate to, but I'm not implying when I say it's a dream that it's not real, that it's uh, inconsequential. I'm not just you know dismissing it. I'm trying to give a different way of thinking of it. And as I explained in, in my own book, where I'm teaching the techniques of lucid dreaming, I'm teaching people how to modify the dream to be able to manifest a more desirable outcome, reality of themselves, and hopefully you know for others as well. So it, it's not that it's just there's no benefit. There's no you know uh, uh, way you can work with it. Quite the opposite. We can. And when I also say it's a dream, I don't want to give people the, it's an analogy, I repeat, I don't want to give people the misconception to imply that like nothing matters because it's just a dream. It does matter. I mean, you can feel pain and you can cause pain and harm to others and this level of our conceptual reality. So it does matter. And that's why, again, I wrote the book as, as a wake up call of the world because we're so divided now from each other, uh, other cultures, other religions, other races, but even from our planet. That's why I say it's like the second expulsion from the Garden of Eden. We'll never in our lifetimes, and perhaps not in our children if we're able to have them on this level, be able to experience the clear air, the clean water that for thousands of years our ancestors enjoyed. We thought we understood how reality works materially, and we made a horrible mess of things. So although it seems when I say dreamlike, that seems so, you know, again, vaporous or inconsequential, no, that is the reality. We have been in the illusion that we understood reality and it was all material and that we could manipulate it like gods. But it's like the, uh, the source's apprentice, you know, tale from ancient Egypt and, and, uh, Greece. Just because we can do things doesn't mean we do them wisely, but it also doesn't mean or repeat that there's no consequences to anything we choose to do or not do on this level of reality. It's not karma, but there are consequences, good or bad. If someone tries to hit the board to go back to that one, and they have a moment of disbelief, there's a good chance they'll hurt their hand and won't break the board. So what I'm hearing is that there is actually a benefit and something that we can take advantage of from understanding and accepting that our life is an illusion, that we come from the source, that the source is observing and experiencing our life through our eyes, yes. as you beautifully put it in your book. And the gift for us here is that we can change our reality. Yes. We can move or quantum jump to an alternative reality. And you have some exercises in your book, how to do this. So let's talk about this. How easily can we literally change our awareness, our consciousness, or quantum jump from one reality to another, where this other one has better outcomes for us or something better that we are striving for? Is it difficult? Is it easy to do? Maybe in between. I don't want to say necessarily it's difficult once you understand it, um, but I want to apply it's so easy because it takes also a discipline. You have to sustain, you know. Uh, I'll give you um, an example may not be known in terms of the background story, which I'll share very quickly, but the person may be well known to your listeners. Arnold Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. uh, came from Austria as a young uh, poor immigrant to the United States. He um, got into the bodybuilding world and became quite uh, proficient in building himself up and competing with other people in bodybuilding contests. And then, as you know, he also became an actor, a Hollywood actor, and he became the governor of California. All this from a teenager coming penniless almost, you know, to a strange, totally foreign culture. About a week or so ago, I heard him in an interview where he shared that he had visualized all of this from the moment he came to America, precisely in detail. Wow. And you might think, well, he's not a spiritual or intellectual person, but it was very interesting that he shared it just so recently. It's the story between almost everybody's success, that they had some vision. You know, we talk about the visionary leadership in, in corporations, and 
sadly, we don't have much visionary leadership right now in the world because, <laughs> you know, it's so yeah. sort of dark and confused. Uh, but yeah. you know, to go back to the Bible, you know, it says, without vision, the people perish. And I'm trying to help people again have that greater awareness to save ourselves and our world. It's in a very threatened state right now. So what is the best formula for manifesting reality? If you could just uh, give us an overview in a nutshell, and I note in your book, you mentioned three key elements, intention, imagination, and belief. And I've added a fourth since, <laughs> I hope I keep, you know, learning. I've added a fourth since then. Oh, well. oh, okay. Oh, great. Yeah, yes. about. So, all right. So I, so I think <laughs> if you want to be able to manifest something or something different, change something, you first have to work with awareness. You have to realize, again, you're not just your, uh, we simply use the word, a skin encapsulated ego. That's just, again, one level. Just like, for example, uh, when we see icebergs and we're, let's say, uh, out on the water on the ship, you see the tip of the iceberg. You don't see what's below the water line. And the tip of the iceberg is only, only 10% of the larger mass, which is there, but you don't see it. So the first step, again, is that awareness beyond yourself, that you're, you're tapping into something greater. We can learn to develop some of this type of awareness through things like meditation. It's not just an intellectual thing, it's experiential. So that, I would say, is where we have to start. Secondly is, yes, intention. You have to have a very clear goal, plan, however you want to call it, of what you want to change or achieve. And then you amplify that. You, you add color, if you like, uh, to the, the form with imagination. And the more vividly we imagine it, the more we're also so to speak, empowering it, uh, helping it manifest into the conceptual reality. And then the last but not least uh, important factor for manifestation is belief. You have to fully believe. If it's all coming from consciousness, coming back to the placebo effect, if, if you believe uh, an inert chemical pill is going to help you, it often will. But if you don't believe it, it usually won't. And also, if you're afraid of side effects, even though it's chemically inert, you'll have side effects from it. So again, belief itself has power. And then when I said there's also discipline, maybe that affects one, because you have to sustain this. Okay, thank you. Yes, these are very simple or seemingly simple steps in the process of manifestation. And the belief step can work positively or negatively, right. because if we have some negative beliefs, that will hold back, if not completely stall the manifestation process. Correct. Okay. And this is all in your book. Yes. Very nicely explained. Okay. My final question. You mentioned a few times throughout this conversation and also when we spoke um, before this interview that you feel there is an urgency in promulgating and, and sharing your message, which you've encapsulated in your book. That's right. What is the urgency or why is the urgency? And what is the message itself? If you would like to elaborate on this for us, thank you. Okay, and going back in part by analogy to say like there's a dreamlike quality to our whole world and it's coming from one source, dream. When we ourselves have dreams coming back to our more conventional experience, sometimes they're pleasant, sometimes they seem symbolic, sometimes they're amusing, sometimes they're very frightening. We call them, you know, nightmares. Or, or sleep terrors, night terrors. And some people have things like sleep paralysis and so on. So it could be very, very unpleasant experience for someone. So if the nature, again, of reality is a dream, it does not mean that it's desirable to have nightmare, right? If, if we want to have awareness of things to be aware of and, and, you know, grow and experiment and have all these different experiences, it doesn't mean that we want to be a night. Because when you're in a nightmare, it's like you're locked in. You're a victim, right? It's not just something you're going to have for a few minutes. When, you, when you're in it, it feels like, no, that's your total reality and you're stuck in it. So right now, as I see this consensual reality we live in, everyday reality for all of us, I see we're in a, I would call a nightmarish state. Almost everything that could be undesirable is happening. We, again, have societal breakdown all over the world where there's more violence. Um, we have pretty well destroyed our formerly pristine 
physical environment. There's record extinction of the animal and plant species that's occurring right now. We have mass migration in many countries, climate refugees, as it's sometimes called. I could go on and on, but I don't want to you know, be depressing. My point is, there are horrible things right now that are happening in our world, and the direction it's getting worse and worse. So I felt, as I understand this, and as a doctor caring to help people, I felt I, I have to try to wake people up to understand. It's like a madness we're caught up in, like wake up from your nightmare. Just as like if we had a child who was having a nightmare, you know, we heard them whimpering or screaming, we, we'd go to their bedside and we would try to comfort them, say, it's okay, I'm here, it's just a nightmare. So I'm trying to sort of, in a sense, fulfill that role in, in the world right now and say, we're in a nightmare, but it is only a nightmare. We can come out of this, but there's things we have to do to come out of it. One is fundamentally, we have to realize our sense of being disconnected and separate from everybody and everything is totally illusion. It's not at all that way. It's the exact opposite way. And then we come back to a place of inner calm and power, be able to change things in a more favorable way. So our future is one, again, of uh, education, uh, fun, uh, different experiences, learning, testing things, but not harming, not harming each other and not harming our world as we are now. In the indigenous cultures, they feel a connection with the physical inanimate environment. To them, it's also alive. Like to your point about if consciousness is you know, source of everything, then yes, it's everywhere in everything. And we've lost, as they say, that connection you know, to the wisdom that many cultures had historically. Some still do, but in the mainstream, we've been captivated by, again, this illusion that reality is material. We understand how to do it. That's where we can have all these technological wonders. But it's like a Faustian bargain. Look what it's costing us. You know, even if I talk about simple emotional state of most people these days, there's an epidemic of loneliness of all things in the world right now. And it's serious. The Surgeon General of the United States has actually written a book on the epidemic of loneliness. Uh, the UK and Japan actually have appointed federal ministers. For loneliness. With portfolios yeah. for loneliness. Um, I'm a doctor, so I'm also very aware how it's affecting my patients and the public. And you might think, how could we be lonely when we're so connected with, you know, our, our devices and so on, like never before in history? But that's why, because it separates us, these devices. Yes, absolutely. Well, this is a very, very profound and poignant message. So thank you. And uh, my final thought is that many people would say we can change one person at a time. And that's true. But I really feel that in which is probably a utopia, or maybe not, because everything is possible. <laughs> yes, that, that's right. That See, I'm, yes. I'm catching myself on, <laughs> on the wrong good. thinking. Is mm -hmm. that the, the, best, the best way for this to occur, for this healing, let's call it healing, to occur, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. In a way it for is, yes. everyone, every person, to understand and accept it at the same time. And I'll give you one quick example with the current war in Gaza, which is just absolutely horrifying and it's mm -hmm. devising mm -hmm. the world, you know, apart from the horror of the, of the war. When yeah. each side says, well, we will cease fire if you, so we'll put the weapons down if you put the weapons down. And the other side says, well, no, we, we do it when you do it first. And what I'm thinking is the only way for the peace to come to this region is for both sides to put down their weapons at the same time. It won't occur in any other way, I believe. Well, you know, I said just briefly before, we're talking about a lot of different things, so I'll just come back to it. The importance of visionary leadership, and we have almost no visionary leaders right now. Yeah. You know, I think back to, uh, again, an uh, example that would be known to many of your listeners not so long ago, Nelson Mandela. Yeah. You know, the, the, the first uh, elected leader of an independent, free South Africa. And when you think back to his history, he was a terrorist leader. And he was imprisoned in solitary confinement for a very long time. And yet, one of the first things he did when he was let out of prison, and he was actually elected to become the leader of this former apartheid regime, was to set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to bring people together. This is an example, to me, of visionary leadership. 
no one's perfect, but so back to your point, uh, it seems obviously more daunting, more maybe even impossible for everybody to simultaneously get it, you know, and agree and be on the same wavelength and cooperate, as you said, both sides equally dropping their their weapons, their arms. Mm -hmm. But if you have visionary leadership, it can inspire people. It can help change the dream for all of us. Yeah. And we really need good people, not 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 charlatans who know how to manipulate the masses emotionally. That's what we really need. Where do we find them, those visionary leaders? That's the question. Well, yeah. uh, we, we all have, again, remember the potential as amphibians to go all the way into a level where we're all connected and we have access to all of the wisdom way beyond chat, GPT, and AI, because it's everything, not just some of which was, you know, uh, reaped from the internet until, you know, 2021. Uh, everything is available to us once you understand that. And so a good leader can open our awareness to it, help us feel the connection. You know, we, even when we look in each other's eyes, and I'm talking now in everyday life, not, you know, through a screen and technology, there's a quality of connection when we make soft eye contact with people. And there's an old ancient, you know, tradition in India of soul gazing. And we have sort of the poetical description sometimes of the eyes being like mm -hmm, windows of mm -hmm. the soul. Well, there's something to it, again, different those reality, and it's complicated to get it, all of it uh, described right now. But if we were even just more aware and intentional when we're talking to people who are in our presence, look in their eyes. It's a very important connection. Don't be, you know, on your smartphone while you're talking to them or looking away at what else is, you know, around in the environment or other people. Seek that connection. Seek that connection. Also, if we were to guide ourselves more with the wisdom of our heart, and we go on and on, and I realize we only have so much time, but in some ancient cultures, they believed that the mind consciousness came physically in our body from the heart. Uh, we in our enlightenment said, no, it comes from, you know, the head. Uh, the brain inside our, our skulls. And yet, there's absolutely no scientific proof at all, zero, that the brain in our head produces consciousness, none. But we do also, on this, again, more conventional level, we have at least three physical brains in our bodies, always. Yeah. So we have the head brain, the heart brain, and we have what we call a gut, or a microbiome brain, which is the bacteria. And there's more DNA in those bacteria in our large bowel than our own human body. And they are not minor players. They're not just like contaminants, even those so bacteria. They can produce the neurotransmitters like serotonin that are important for the head brain functioning. And the heart, actually, we now know, has its own nervous system, has its own neuron. It has its own memory system. The heart has more nerves that go up and control brain function in the head than the brain can influence the heart. The heart can also secrete the love hormone, oxytocin. We believe, too, the heart is a portal for that deeper level of intuitive awareness and connection with source. So if people are more guided, and we sometimes talk about people being warm-hearted or, you know, a heartfelt attitude, there's something to it. So we need to get more in touch with the wisdom of our heart and feel out things more. Yes. Oh, well, Howard, uh, we could be chatting for another 10 hours. <laughs> this is so, <laughs> <I know. laughs> so, so fascinating, and, and you are a, a treasure chest of of profound insights and knowledge. So thank you, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate your time and this conversation. Before we close, is there anything else that you would like to add to leave our audience with? No, but just to reiterate what I said earlier too, that I wrote this book for the people. It's not for me. It's not for a profit. It's not for any publicity whatsoever for myself. It's the message. I've even had uh, an audiobook version that's produced by a woman announcer from the BBC, because I didn't want it to seem like it's about my voice. It's not about me. I have realized something, I say, but I've connected the dots. And many people in the world historically have contributed some you know, aspects of what I'm working with. But ultimately, I'm trying to share something to liberate everyone from being entrapped in their nightmares and to save this level of our world. So it will be more like a a desirable dreamlike world, not a nightmare, not a dystopian reality. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, once again, Dr. Eisenberg, thank you so much for your time and for this fascinating conversation. And I will include all the links, including to your books in the show notes. And I do encourage every listener of this show to purchase the book. And I'm very grateful for you writing the book 
if people have any questions or would like to contact you for further guidance or about the book or any other assistance, are you accessible in this regard? Somewhat. I mean, we're talking, in my case, I'm trying to outreach to the whole world, not just what, you know, one country. <laughs> um, so, and it's just me. So, you know, I, I don't have like a staff behind me, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm open. I mean, there are people right now who are contacting me from different parts of the world. And when I'm able to be, you know, of, of some help, I'm glad to within the limits of my time and energy. I would say, though, to other people who are listening who want more information, even beyond what's in the book itself, on my website, I have a dedicated book webpage, which has many of the podcast interviews. So they can also hear me explaining uh, in more maybe ordinary terms and using like more familiar analogies what's in the book that way. It's all, it's all free. Beautiful. Well, Dr. Eisenberg, thank you so much and all the best. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Be well. Namaste. Namaste. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.